Today we are in the second to last message of our series, What's in a Name? Uh, last week we kind of took a, a turn. We had been focusing on the Jehovah uh, names and then we moved into Elohim last week. And so we really kind of went back all the way to Genesis, back to Genesis chapter 1 of looking at what does Elohim mean. And we kind of really broke it down that Elohim is plural for gods or plural for spiritual beings in the, the, the book of Genesis. And the Elohim was almost a blanket term that individuals at the time would use for the gods. But we talked about how our God is the Elohim of Elohim, the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. That you could say, well, this is an Elohim, but this is the Elohim. And we use Elohim when we refer to God for one main reason is our God is three gods in one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three in one is why we speak of Elohim. But today we're going to look at the first of two different uh, names using Elohim, like we were using Jehovah Jireh, Je Jehovah Shalom. We're going to be using El and Roy. El Roy is the, the name that we're going to be looking at today, and I'll get into that in just a moment. But what I actually, I'll just say right offhand, it just, and this is where it gets tied perfectly into the word that Donna that you gave, that El Roy is the God who sees me. Donna, you didn't know that that was my topic today. Here's the thing I, I need you to realize. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you and gives you a word, tells you to do something, Donna didn't know what I'm preaching on today. But when the Holy Spirit speaks something to you and you just know in your spirit that you've got to do something, you've got to say it, you've got to go and talk to that person, you need to uh, go and pray for this person, whatever it may be, you need to listen and do what God calls you to do. Because in that sense... I knew this is what I was supposed to preach, but it all the more confirms coming off of the, the worship team and that word that, okay, God's up to something. And I think this is one of those topics that we as a church need, but our community needs, our world needs. And as you hear it, I want this to, in, I'm going to read, read something to you. And at first it's going to potentially discourage you, but I want it to encourage you in the big picture. So health insurers insure Cigna's 2018 U.S. Loneliness Index. They really study these things. Found that 46% of Americans report feeling lonely sometimes or always, and 47% report feeling left out sometimes or always. A little less, 43% report feeling isolated from others, and the same number report feeling that they lack companionship and their relationships lack meaning. The report surveyed 20,000 people in the U.S. using UCLA's loneliness scale, a 20-item questionnaire it says is designed to measure one's subjective feelings of loneliness as well as feelings of social isolation. A score of 43 or higher on the scale is considered lonely. The study approached the subject from the perspective of its effect on health and well-being, citing research that suggests loneliness has the same impact on mortality as smoking 15 cigarettes per day. 27% of Americans rarely or never feel like there are people who understand them. Only 27% feel that they belong to a group of friends. One in five Americans rarely, if ever, feel close to others, and only about half, 53%, report having meaningful in-person social interactions with friends or family on a daily basis. Feelings of, or feelings of loneliness are worse in younger generations than in older ones. With Generation Z and Millennials reporting higher feelings of loneliness and isolation on the loneliness scale than older generations. Gen Z, uh, ages 18 to 22 uh, of this study, scored a loneliness ratio of 48.3 out of 80, making them the loneliest generation. Millennials, ages 23 to 37, come in second with the loneliness score of 45.3. And then the greatest generation, ages 72 and older, are the least lonely with a score of 38.6. More than half of Gen Zers identify with 10 of the 11 feelings associated with loneliness. About 60% feel left out or isolated from others, according to the report. Now you hear that, and now I want to draw your attention back to one little detail of that. Because you probably are, your mind is wrapped up with all of the statistics. That was 2018. That's pre-COVID by two years. How much more has that exponentially grown and moved 
drastically in the other direction. If you took this exact same study, I'm sure that those numbers are increased. And it's easy to look at it and say, well, that's because millennials, and that's because Gen Z, they're always in their phones, they're always doing this, or they're always doing that. Do you know why they do those things? They're looking for attention. And do you know why all of a sudden we can look at our world and say, wow, our world is very quickly going in this direction? Because they're finding people online that will actually give them attention and validate the things that they're thinking instead of discipling them and discipling them out of the things of this world and discipling them into the things of God. And let me just even throw one more little kink in that. The fact that on any regular basis I have to come up and say, hey, I need more people to serve in kids ministry, I don't want to ever hear anyone say, well, Gen Z... They're just, they're too preoccupied. They're this, they're that, they're, and you realize that there's, Gen Z is not even our youngest generation anymore. It's now Gen Alpha. My daughters are a part of Gen Alpha. So when we look at our kids' ministry, if that's where Gen Z is, where is Gen Alpha going to be? And we have to realize the fact that if the world is getting lonelier, as the world is getting further and further away, and if we have the answer that is Jesus, then why aren't we pointing people towards Jesus? Why do we have to ask people to serve? Why do we have to ask people to give? Because if we have the answer and we truly have Jesus in us and Jesus is moving in us and changing us and adapting us, then we need to be individuals you're going to see this morning that see other people. Because if God is the God that sees me, then that means that as I am a new creation, as I am in Christ, as I'm replicating Jesus to a world that desperately needs Jesus, that means something has to change in me so I can see others that need Jesus. When we hear statistics like that saying this is the loneliest generation, well, we should do something about that. When you hear an opportunity to say, you know what, we, we have an opportunity with the warming center that we have an opportunity to go and see people that don't feel seen and show them the love of Jesus. Why don't we do it? Is it uncomfortable for me? When we have an opportunity to serve in a kid's ministry, why don't we do it? I'm going to just even share with myself that in the beginning of the, the school year, Annie came to me and made the statement that they needed someone to be a mentor for uh, eight ninth grade boys at Parkway every Thursday morning. And at first I'm like, well, that's going to mess up my schedule a little bit. And then I just felt that, like, well, this is what you're supposed to do. So every... Uh, every Thursday morning, I'm going and hanging out with these eight uh, ninth graders. And even I, I've started this thing this uh, last week or so with this tub of questions with them that I threw a bunch of questions in. We, before we started doing anything, like this past week, we went out and I played basketball with the group of them. But I pulled out one question, and, and the question was, tell me something about yourself that no one else in this room knows. And so there's a couple of just random answers, and one of them looked at me and said, You wouldn't know by looking at me, but I deal with depression on a regular basis. And I just stopped him in his tracks and said, you know what, let me me just talk to you for a second. If you ever need someone to talk to, I'm here for you. And the look in his face, it, it said everything in that moment of like, hey, there could be someone here that could want to talk with me. It's a lonely generation, but we know the God that sees them. We know the God that sees us, but if we want to show them the God that sees them, that we need to know that this is the God that sees us. Amen? And now here's something I even wanted to say. I want this to to sink into your mind. At some point, this walk with Christ has to go beyond what can I get from other people? What can I get from the church? What can Jesus do for me to say, now that I am in Christ, what can I do for others? Let me lay my wants, my needs, my desires, all of that. Let me lay it all down so I can put my focus on what does God want me to do for others. That's the end goal in all of this. But before I jump into the passage of scripture where this name comes from, I want you to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, your word is written in my mind and hidden in my heart. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will seek you with all of my strength. My greatest desire is to be a disciple and to make more disciples. I will live my life according to your word. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. 
We're going into Genesis chapter 16, and this is where we see the name El Roy come from. Now, Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me by, be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with a contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so they cannot... Uh, so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over all, against all his kinsmen. So she, named, she, so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly hear I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Unlike so many of these other names, pretty much every name that we've covered so far, the name has come from one of the major players in, in the Bible, whether it's Moses or it's Abraham or some other capacity along those lines, this is the first time that we're seeing a name come from someone who's not a main character, that Hagar is connected to the main character, but she really is the side character in all of this. As a quick recap of the story, Abraham, this is before he gets the name of Abraham as Abram, uh, that he found himself starting to near that age of 100. He had been promised children. He hasn't had children. And He's, he's trying to figure out, okay, God, you made this promise to me. You told me that you were going to give me uh, this family that was going to outnumber the stars, but I don't even have a kid yet. And then here we see that he was at the age of 86 when this happens, and he's, this is still not the promised son that uh, Abraham was going to receive, that him and his wife decide to go the wrong way and do something else. Men, let me just suggest to you right now, if your wife says you should go and sleep with this other woman, that's not a good idea. Even if it sounds like it's godly advice, don't do it. But he goes ahead and he sleeps with the Egyptian servant, Hagar, and she gets pregnant. Uh, that Hagar is appeared to be disliked by Sarai. I don't know why she might dislike her, but she does. She flees, and then all of a sudden she's out in the, the wilderness, and she all of a sudden has this interaction with the angel of the Lord. And if you remember from a few weeks ago, we discussed this idea that when the angel of the Lord gets mentioned, this is a visit from Jesus in person that we see happen in the Old Testament that ceases to happen after Jesus comes down, born of Mary. So she is not only just getting the Moses type of experience where there's a burning bush, she is interacting with Jesus before Jesus was ever born. So when you, she makes a statement that you're the God who sees me, you're El Roy, she means you came down and saw me, the Egyptian servant in the middle of nowhere. This wasn't you coming to see Abraham. This wasn't you coming to see Sarah. This is you coming to see Hagar. Why are you coming to see me? Because God saw something in her. And here's the thing that I want you to realize the, we, we can work with this word that like, he sees us. But I want to kind of expand this this morning. So we know that God sees us, but here's the next thing. Because he sees us, he chose us. Because he sees us, he chose us. So let me run with this idea with the, the turkey bowl this afternoon. 
let's say that you were going to be made a captain of one of the teams. And you get to make the pick of who do I want for my first pick. Now, in my mind, if you get to let me pick whatever team that I want to have, I would start off with Tom Brady for my quarterback. Then, even though he's a little bit old now, I'd still want Barry Sanders because he's just a phenomenal running back. Let's get Calvin Johnson. But here's the problem. I can pretty much guarantee the three of them will not show up to our turkey bowl this afternoon. And so I can't choose somebody that I can't see. If they're not there, if I can't see them, I can't choose them. So this is one of the things I want you to realize, that God sees you so he can choose you. You may be sitting here thinking, well, but God doesn't fully know my past. Yes, he does, because he sees you. God knows everything about you. And then when God comes alongside you and says, I want you to do this, you can trust the fact that God wants you to do this because he sees you, he wants you involved, he wants you to participate, and he's choosing you to do that next thing for him, to do the thing for him that I may not be able to do, the person next to you may not be able to do, but you're able to do because God has called you to it. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That God saw you, he saw you in your faults, in your failures, in your mistakes, and he still chose you anyways. And as he chooses you and he calls you out of the mess, as he causes you, calls you out of the sin, out of the struggles, out of all of those different things, he's calling you to the next level of what he wants you to do. And as you say yes and as you obey, you will go from this step to the next step to the next step. You say, well, well God's not giving me this, this opportunity. Have you done what God's called you to do on level one yet? You don't get to go from level one to level five. You go level one to two to three to four to five, and you wind up at five, and then you look back and say, look how far God brought me. There is no cheat code. There is no um, special like password that you put in that lets you skip through tests and trials. God will be with you in the tests and trials so he can get you to where he wants you so that you can minister to the person that God has for you to minister. You say, well, I don't know why God's having me go through this. You don't understand now, but when you're through it, you'll get the opportunity to minister to somebody who needs that in order so that they can experience Jesus. He sees you, so he chooses you. And we are all a part, ultimately, of God's redemptive plan for this world. The next thing is he knows us. In John chapter 4, we see Jesus going to the Samaritan woman at the well. He saw her. He made a point that he was going to see her because there was other ways that he could have went to get to where he was going, but he told the disciples, we have to go this way. And then he sent them off for, for food, and so he intentionally goes so he can see the Samaritan woman at the well, and when he sees her, he calls her, and then begins telling her everything about her that nobody else knew, or at least she hadn't communicated to Jesus. He sees her. He knows her, and he's called her. And then as they have this interaction, she then goes back in the town and tells everyone, you need to come see this man who has told me everything I have ever done. I think he might be the Messiah. I think he might be the one that, that we're waiting for, that the one's going to come that's going to save everyone. Here's the thing. God knows everything about you because he sees you and because he knows you. And as he knows you and he calls you, don't be surprised by the fact that God calls you to do something that you might not feel capable of because God knows you're capable of it. When we look at Psalms 139.7, we see that we cannot flee from his presence. In Luke 12.7, we see that he knows each uh, hair of our head is numbered. In Psalm 56.8, our tears are counted and stored. In 1 Samuel 16.7, the Lord looks to the heart, not outward appearance. God knows you. He not only sees you, he not only uh, picks you, calls you, but he knows you. And it's comforting to know that we don't have to pretend and we don't have to hide from God. I think back to the beginning of Genesis when Adam and Eve eat of the fruit. They do what they're not supposed to do. God's not surprised. They try to hide. They try to make clothes out of fig leaves. But then all of a sudden, God's walking through and saying, where are you? 
and then eventually they pop out. It's almost like when you're playing hide-and-go-seek with a toddler. Here's, I, I can solve hide-and-go-seek with toddlers for you really quickly. They will hide in one of three places. It will be very obvious. Like if they're behind curtains, their feet are going to be sticking out. You give them another opportunity to hide, and they will still hide in one of those three places. And you do that whole routine, oh, I can't see you, where are you? And as the kids get older, the hiding spaces only get slightly more elaborate. And in the case of Adam and Eve, God wasn't calling, where are you, because I don't know where you are, but he's giving them an opportunity for him to call them out, for him to be able to come back in the relationship with them. The next thing in this process is that God hears us. Let that one sink in for a moment, that God hears us. There's times where we cry out to God about the hidden things in our life, our struggles, that when we feel like we're unseen, when we feel like nobody understands us, when we call out about the pain and the struggle of life, Jesus went through it all. And because Jesus went through it all, not only can God hear us, but he can do something about it. But there's this reality that sometimes we feel like, well, I can't do anything for God because all these things are going on in my life. No, call out to God and say, God, this is what's going on in my life. That if God wants to call you to do something, that if God wants to call you to this next level, if God wants to, to call you into a different type of ministry, say, God, I'm willing to go, but God, you got to give me, you got to give me some help. You got to help me here. You got to help me get through this. If God is wanting you to do this, God's going to provide the means for you to do this. Whatever it is, whether it's taking a different job that you feel like, well, I don't know if I'm capable of taking that job. If God is calling you to that job, then God's going to supply everything you need. That if God is speaking to you and wants you to go and tell someone about him, God's going to provide you the opportunity to begin praying. Say, God, if you want me to do this, this is your child. You created them in your image. I'm willing to go and do what you call me to do, but you got to give me the opportunity and watch as God does. When we look at Exodus 3, 7 through 9, it says, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the crying of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. God never abandoned his people. He knew where his people were. But it's foreshadowing what's to come. Because if God can get his people out of Egypt, then God can easily get his people out of sin and provide a way out. Now let me give you an example for a moment. Pretend some of the Israelites didn't want to go with Moses and they wanted to stay in captivity. Nobody made them leave Egypt. They had to choose to do so. And even as they chose to do so and they went out into the wilderness, there's moments where they're choosing to not hear the voice of God. They have to listen to the voice of God because, yes, they can cry out, but God is hearing them. But what it does is it leads us to the next point is that God also speaks to us. We're not serving a God that's mute. We're not serving a God who's deaf. We're not serving a God that's incapable of communication to, to us and from us. But we're serving a God that has the ability to speak directly to us. And we can listen to what God is saying to us, teaching us, correcting us, with, training us in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 deals with that whole topic. But what we realize is that God has already given us an instruction manual. And I say this often, but I want you to realize this. Before you go seeking a new fresh word from God, how about you study the one that he already gave us that's more than enough? Because if we're unwilling to study the word that God has already given to us, I, I mean, I can put myself in my, my parents' shoes for a moment. When I've said the same thing 20 times, I'm going to stay silent until you fix the problem that I've already told you to fix. And so often we expect God to do something new and fresh when God's already given us the answer. So we need to he hear from God just as much as we're expecting God to hear from us. Because we go to God and say, God, I need you to do this and this and this and this. And God's saying, that's, that's great. I'll do all those things. Will you do what I've called you to do first? Will you cross the street and tell your neighbor about Jesus that I've asked you to do 27 times? Will you go into your workplace tomorrow and not gossip? Will you spend some time in prayer? 
Will you change the things about your life that I'm asking you to change? I see you. I know where you are. I haven't forgotten you. I have not forsaken you. But I need you to grow. And so God hears us, but then he speaks to us. So if we're expecting God to hear us and do something, then we need to hear from God and do something as well. And when we look to the scripture and we're filled with the spirit, we can know God's will for us and know more of his nature and know who he is. He's not just watching over us. God is a personal God who communes and comes close to us through the word and by his spirit. And as we sing a song like we just did of, oh, how he loves us, I need you to realize that that's just not fancy words that are on a screen that are there to invoke emotion. God actually loves you. And you may be sitting here today thinking, well, I don't know if God sees me. God sees you and wants to interact with you if you'll simply just put your guard down a little bit and, and open up your mind to say, okay, God, what is it that you want me to do? And then the next thing is this. He saves us. The start of the beginning, he sees us. That leads us all the way to the fact that he saves us. Because he sees us, because he sees us in our struggles, because he sees us in our faults, because he sees us in our failures, he's still going to come and he's going to call us because he knows us and he wants to grow us and he wants to hear us and he wants to speak to us because he wants to save us. Because even as he's going to the cross to bear the weight of all sin from all humanity, from the beginning to the end, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's Luke 23, 34. He has the plan to save his people from the beginning. We see in Genesis 3 where everything begins falling apart and we get all the way to the book of Revelation and we see the fact that God has won. When we look at Isaiah 53, 12, we see this prophecy of his death that he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That his death was prophesied and he went through and did what he needed to do because he sees you. That it's not just about me or anyone else in this room. That if you were the only one that needed saving, that Jesus would have still did it just for you. But here's the, the, the flip of this. When we realize that God sees us on that level, it means that he sees everyone else that he has created in that level as well. And he sees a world that's lost, that is his creation in his image, that belong to him, if they would simply just accept him as Lord and Savior. And this is the most important thing for us today. We love the fact that God sees us. Do we love the fact that God sees other people as well? It has to impact us. It has to change us. Because as we are in Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That people begin seeing us. Like this phrase that used to be used quite a lot, that we need to become Jesus with flesh on us. That this is the people's ability of seeing Jesus uh, walking around. That we have the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, but we don't need the angel of the Lord in the New Testament because Jesus has already come and we are that representation of Jesus to people. There is no need for an angel of the Lord to show up in this day and age because the angel of the Lord already came and died that death for each and every one of us so that we could go out and be that, uh, that individual that would go and redeem people through the power of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. That here's the, the overall point this morning with this idea of El Roy and why I think it's such a powerful name is that God sees you so that he can choose you because he knows you, he hears you, and he speaks to you so that he can save you. God is fully aware of exactly where you are. You might feel this morning of like you are stuck in struggle and you cannot get out of that struggle. Worship team, uh, go ahead and come forward. And I'll call our, our prayer team up in just a moment. But as we prepare to just go back into a time of worship to end this morning, here's the thing I want you to realize is that if you're in here today and you feel like, I just don't know if God sees me, God does. And I'm going to encourage you this morning that I want you to, to seek him. I want you to, uh, the, to come to the altar. If you need to come to the altar, come to our prayer team in a moment. If you need to be prayed over, that God sees you. He knows you. He brought you here today for that very purpose. 
There's no reason to walk out of here and not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But also in this room today, let me just encourage you that I think there's some people that you're just waiting for the right opportunity. Well, God, would you do this? And God, would you do that? God hasn't forgotten you. He knows exactly where you are. I want you to, to think of something that is special to you. Something that you put in a particular spot in your house, in your car, at your job, wherever it might be. It's special, it's unique, it's got a purpose. Even just what comes to my mind, not that it's special to me, but my, my microphone and my headset. It goes in a particular spot in my office. I use it once a week on Sunday morning. So when it's time for me to come down and preach, I open that drawer and I pull it out and guess what? It's there. It's exactly where it needs to be, exactly when it needs to be there. And if you're sitting back saying, well, I, I just feel like God's not using me, that God's not, I have so much more to offer. God knows exactly where you are. He's got you in the exact right drawer. So when the right moment for God to use you is available, all of a sudden, God can open that drawer and say, now it's time to pull this out and use this tool. Because this person needs to know about Jesus. This is, this is the right person to tell them about Jesus. But the problem is, is we get so focused on, God, can you see me? Can you see the things that I'm doing for you? Can you, see, can you see this over here? And I'm doing all these great things here and all these great things over here. All these great things, all the things I'm doing for you. You're doing them for yourself. You're not doing it for God. Because if you're doing it for God, you're saying, you know what? I am fully comfortable. This is the box that God has put me in. I don't need to be in that box. I don't need to be in this box. I don't need people to know my name. I don't need anything. I'm going to sit right here in this box doing what I was designed to do. And when God Almighty, creator of the universe, is ready to use me, he can come and pluck me, put me where I need to be. I'll do what he calls me to do. And if he puts me back in that box, then I'll go back in that box. If he leaves me on the desk so that I can be ready for the next assignment, wherever you put me, God, wherever you put me. Because is it the matter of do you want God to see you or do you want mankind to see you in all the things that you're doing? Because I don't, my calling is not based on you seeing me. My calling is based on does God see me? Am I where God calls me to be? If God wants me here, great. If God wants to move me across the planet, great. Wherever God calls me to be, I need to be. Wherever God calls you, you need to be. We need to stop living for other people's attention and say, God, whatever it is, El Roy, I know you see me. I know you have me where you want me to be. I know you're using me and I don't understand it, but I will sit in this drawer and I will wait to be used by you because you're the God who sees me. And I know that there's people that you want to be seen and so I'll be ready and willing to go and do what it is. I don't care if it gets me all this notary and attention and publicity. I don't care if it's just one person because every person matters in the grand scheme of heaven and in eternity. So this morning, if prayer team, if you would go ahead and come forward. If you need to be prayed for this morning because you've never accepted Jesus and you want to accept Jesus this morning, come forward. If you need to come forward and just lay it down on the altar and say, you know what, God, I've been so focused on being seen for myself. Would you just help me this morning, God? Would you help me to realize that you want to do something great in my life? But I need to be ready to be seen by you, not by man. Then come to the altar as well. I just, I want us as we worship just to realize that it is all about God seeing us and us being ready to be used by God. Because there's people that need to know that they're seen by God. You've walked through that experience. You've had that moment before. Now it's our turn to help other people realize that they're seen by God as well. Will you just stand as we worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as we worship El Roy, the God who sees you, that knows exactly where you are, knows exactly your struggles, knows that he wants to do an incredible things through you if you'll only let him. Let's worship this morning.